So welcome everybody to the next episode of Paving the Way Home and we're delighted uh, to have with us this week Father Shane Sullivan from the parish of Castlebar in County Mayo in the west of Ireland. Father Shane, you're very welcome. Thanks very much, Brian. It's great to be with you guys. Uh, awesome. Before we go any further, can we begin with a prayer, Father Shane? Yeah, it's great. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle within them the fire of thy love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of thy faithful, grant by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise, and ever rejoice in his consolation, through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady, seat of wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, before, uh, before I go any further, I'm going to make a confession because thing is, uh, I'm with a Catholic priest and everything. So anyone that was watching the Father Patrick Cattle interview would have heard me say, welcome to the very first episode of Paving the Way Home. And technically that's true, but in some ways it's not because technically the very first recording was with Father Shane Sullivan. But we won't go into any details there, but we had some uh, unexpected, uh, unwelcome visitors. So it was, uh, it, it, the, the recording um, uh, it just didn't work out that time. I think Father Patrick Cahill uh, referred to that incident in one of his homilies recently, but uh, it was absolutely fantastic to be back here again uh, with you, Father Shane. Um, Thank you. So Father Shane, first of all, um, you know, here, here you are, a priest in the West of Ireland. I have to ask the question, what is an American doing in, as a parish priest in the West of Ireland? Uh, so my, the short answer is that my dad is from the West of Ireland. My dad is from a small parish in Connemara called Karna, and he immigrated to the United States in the 1970s. There wasn't much work here. Met my mother, and so then our, me and my uh, my brothers and sisters and I were raised in Chicago and then later on in Minnesota. We moved to Minnesota uh, when we were kids. So that's where we grew up, but we had always had a very strong sense of my dad's uh, being Irish and us being Irish. I know Irish people sometimes laugh at that, the Americans who sort of have notions that they're Irish or whatever, but we did. We <laughs> did. We really did. We thought that we were Irish until I came here and then I was told very quickly, no, you're not. <laughs> so I, uh, I moved here halfway through my seminary formation in 2008. And then I was ordained a priest in 2012. And I've been serving in the Archdiocese of Chum ever since. And you say you moved here halfway through your seminary formation. Uh, if you don't, don't mind me asking, where were you doing uh, your formation beforehand? Was that uh, it was that uh, in, a, in the Diocesan Seminary in the United States? It was, yeah. It was in the uh, one of the best places I've ever come across, one of the greatest seminaries I've ever come across, a place called St. John Vianney College Seminary. People have heard of St. John Vianney uh, Seminary. Typically, they think of Denver, which is the, the major seminary. But there's a, a college seminary, which is basically your, the first four years, so like your undergraduate degree. Uh, you're eight, mm. typically the guys that I studied with were between 18 and 22. We were just, just out of uh, high school. And we, we studied there in St. Paul in Minneapolis. So when I started there, this was just giving an indication of some indication of the fruitfulness of this place. Uh, but when I started in 2004, there were, I think about 70, 70 of us or so. And when I left, uh, four years later, there were like 160 of us. Wow. So it more than doubled over the course of those four years. It was, we literally had to rent houses off campus. The place was just booming. Booming. I know, it's, I know it had a very profound effect on you as well, because I know like even over um, the last number of years here in Ireland, um, just listening to um, you know, so, some of your homilies, a few times you've referred to, you know, spiritual directors or director formation during your time uh, in the United States. And they obviously, you can, you, can, you can tell by that, that they had a very, very positive uh, effect on you. Yeah, very much. I mean, there were, uh, it really was a place of uh, brotherhood, the way that it's, it's kind of uh, 
uh, the way that it could be, as good as it could be. And also uh, a beautiful sense of fatherhood as well. Like the priests very much, we had the, a relationship with them like our, like our fathers. We trusted them very much. We knew that they had our best interest in mind and that they were men who were worth following. They really taught us okay. a lot about fatherhood. There was a man, Father William Bear, who uh, died uh, sadly, very young, uh, two and a half years ago now, but he was very much my spiritual father. And, uh, I owe an awful lot to him and to the other priests and to the, the men of the seminary at that time. I, it really was uh, a pivotal place for me in my life. Uh, not only discovering my vocation, but just basically like growing in, uh, in love of the Lord and in my faith. Wow, that's beautiful. And like, I, I know that the topic of today's um, talk is going to be uh, on discernment, but how, um, how, how, did you, how did you discern that move? Like from, it's a huge, first of all, it's a huge move to decide to, you know, to, 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 to give your life to follow Christ, to enter a seminary, to go down the path of priesthood, but then right. halfway through to go from the home country to a completely different country. I know you had your connections in Ireland, but you're still going to the, going across the Atlantic. That was a huge, huge move. Um, that that took some discernment. That was that that that, that was unbelievable. How uh, can you can, can you explain that one? Yeah. So I think that they are very significant steps, uh, particularly moving to Ireland was a big was a, a big step. But actually, move, going to seminary. One of the really important things for me when I was 18 years old and first thinking about this was being reassured that this was not signing your life away on the dotted line. This was, uh, it, it wasn't as though you going to seminary, you were convinced you were definitely called to be a priest. They were very clear on that. And I thank God, because I, I was not, I was not in any way convinced that I was supposed to be a priest. I had some vague notion that there was something in this for me. There was a restlessness. God wouldn't let me. Uh, I couldn't just move past this. I couldn't just set this aside and move on uh, with what I had planned to do with my life. So uh, talking to the people who were uh, kind of who were leading the seminary and who were uh, representing the diocese that I had studied for, they were I mean, they were very honest in saying a lot of guys go to seminary and a lot of guys leave. And that's a sign of a healthy seminary. It's a place, it's the place where you discern. And that was reassuring for me because I didn't have a, it all figured out. I yeah. needed a place to go to ask that question. What does God, uh, what does God have in mind for my life? And I needed support in answering that question and kind of just in exploring it. And seminary was the place to do it. So uh, in my seminary, a lot of guys came in and a lot of my best friends left then and are now married. Uh, and many of them are, have gone on to priesthood as well. That's successful seminary, <laughs> you know, guys discern. That's, that's amazing because look, I know we first met each other uh, when in, in, in Maynooth, we were both uh, in seminary together. Uh, I spent my, uh, what was it? three, four years, whatever it was in seminary. But the one thing I found uh, about seminary, particularly I spent my first year in Maynooth um, and St. Patrick's College Maynooth, because it's such a huge building and a huge ground, it's, you know, for the first year, you're kind of finding your bearings and it's a lot, it, it's, it's so easy to, um, you know, there, there's so much space and everything around is so beautiful to visit. But, so much, but what I found in the Irish College in Rome, because it's kind of more like a large house, Mm -hmm. where his um and you had a lot of bodies under that roof where all of a sudden everything is so when you're when you're living every day uh with with all different personalities and you're kind of li living this kind of enclosed thing it, it it teaches you a lot about yourself and that's the one thing particularly my time in rome which i like minute in rome i absolutely love my time and i often always say if i had the time back again i do it all again because it taught me a lot about myself that I was very able to bring into my marriage, a lot of good and bad things, the bad things in particular that were, you know, how, you know, things within myself that I need to work on that I never really realized uh, until, you know, be, being in there and, and even just to have the time to, to study, to pray. Uh, it's like that when I entered seminary, 
I felt called to, um, to, to priesthood, but at the same time, didn't know what the, what the Lord had in mind. And I always say the hardest decision I ever had to make was uh, actually to leave, funnily enough. Mm. Um, I know a lot of people thinking, whoa, to enter seminary is a big decision. It mm. was, of course, but the hardest, the hardest, the hardest decision, without a doubt, was to leave and, um, uh, and that. But yet, um, you know, and a lot of that was to do with fear. A lot of that was to do like, what does the Lord have in store for me? Because I really thought this, and it wasn't, I didn't leave because I absolutely hated it. I absolutely loved it. But yet I just knew in my prayer that God was calling me to, to, to something else. Um, and that took a, that took a lot of discernment. Yeah. So, um, so that kind of, I guess, was leads us on to, um, to, to, to the main, uh, to the main topic today. I guess, um, the word discernment, the word discernment sometimes it can be thrown around, uh, you know, can be thrown around a little too loosely um, as well. I find, I think just because of the world we're living in, we're living in such a technological age, we're so busy, we're so busy with our work, with our families, we're, we're constantly on phone, on the screens, on the thing, and, and, and we, we don't, it's so hard today to, to have that time to, you know, just to step back at times to, to listen to what, um, to what God is, 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 is calling to us uh, to, in whatever state of life we're in. Um, and this is like, that is crucial for discernment, isn't it? The, the whole, you know, the, the taking the time because it's, you know, sometimes we can say, you know, we can say, oh yeah, yeah, I'm going to, I have something coming up. I'm going to discern this. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to discern it. And it's, a, it's something we can, you know, at times, and I don't know, I have I thrown that phrase out loosely, but when you actually think of what is required in discernment, um, and it's a total kind of vulnerability, vulnerability and letting go uh, and letting God in charge instead of yourself. Uh, what are your thoughts on the whole discernment process? Uh, yes, I agree with you. The, the, the thing that you mentioned there about how difficult it is to take time away, I think it just points to, I think it just points to the, uh, the fact that discernment is supposed to take place in the context of you know, like your normal living your faith. Yeah. You know, so like normally you should be taking time out of each day to spend with God, yeah. whatever you're doing, whether you're a student in university, whether you're uh, in secondary school still, whether you're married or priest, everybody should be taking certain amount of time every day to give to God or and every week. And then maybe uh, something a little bit more stan substantial, you know, on a, a more infrequent basis, you know, once a month or some times a year or something. But, uh, the discernment does it has to happen within the context of like a normal like your normal life of faith basically it's you're living your life of faith you're trying to grow in virtue you're trying to grow in holiness you're being faithful to what god has asked of you in your current state of life again whether that's a student or married or single and you're working or whatever it is that you're doing uh to be faithful to those things that god has asked you to do discernment is simply okay taking a period of time and now turning your attention towards some question that is now uh, kind of, uh, it's confronting you. Some decision has to be made and now you have to discern. And so, yes, normally uh, it takes place in the context of your normal prayer life uh, where there should be that silence and that time where you spend with God. Uh, and then this time of discernment is uh, almost a, a special season that you enter into when you're confronted with some decision that has to be made. Can I ask you, I know this is probably, a, 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 this, is, this is quite a personal question. Can you explain how your discernment process going towards priesthood, um, what that was like, what were the, what were the various stages of that? Because I know there's, um, I, I know there's probably so many people listening, both maybe young people who are young lads who might be discerning priesthood, but like these stages that you're saying is, this is obviously not just for priesthood. This, these are, these are how you discern. But um, I know, I know it's a, it, it can be an area that a lot of people have questions on, but just maybe not necessarily know how to do. Right. Uh, I think my, uh, my story would be a great, maybe uh, the way to describe it would be how not to discern. All right. uh, <laughs> listen and learn from me, sit back, you know, and take notes. This is how not to discern. Um, okay. I, I think my, my sense, this is my sense, is that people tend towards one or two, uh, uh, let's say, 
one or two uh, attitudes or dispositions. The first is an impulsivity where you're, you don't take a lot of time to make decisions. You just sort of act. You just sort of go and do. And there's not a lot of reflection there. And then the other kind of, uh, on the other end of the spectrum is where the people, where, where someone analyzes and analyzes and analyzes and never makes a decision. They're paralyzed basically. Uh, and again, maybe fear is, is kind of a profound uh, experience for them there uh, as well. So if I was to characterize myself young as a, you know, as a younger man in high school, just before I entered seminary, it was definitely the impulsive. I was the guy who was just like, oh, all right, well, I'll give this a shot. I'll give this a shot. And I, I, I didn't uh, take an awful lot of time to sit back and think about the direction my life was going in, where I wanted to, where I wanted to, to go, um, et cetera. So that said, this should be like a, a, a beautiful reason to have confidence in God, right? Because even though I was not doing it correctly, I mean, I was, I was really, I really didn't know what I was doing. All the same, God worked with what he had. God worked with me and God didn't, you know, God didn't sort of, uh, God doesn't have his will set for us in his mind. And uh, if we don't proceed or along the path that he has kind of laid out for us, he sort of cuts us loose and abandons us. Not so. Uh, God is forever working within us and with the decisions that we make. And I, my story is a great example of that. I, discovered my vocation uh, without an awful lot of uh, reflection and careful thought on my part, a lot of cooperation. Uh, if you do bring those things to the table, you're going to have a much easier time of it, right? Yeah. So anyway, I, 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 I went to seminary very, I had a, uh, an experience uh, just after prayer where the possibility of priesthood was presented to me. And I, I found strangely myself drawn to the idea of priesthood, of serving as a priest, of being a priest. And that was so strange for me because I was not living my faith with integrity. I was dating a girl that I really liked. We, I mean, we got along really well and we were quite happy in, our, in dating in, in high school. And I knew all the, the sacrifices that a priest would make, and I had no interest in that. And yet, when I was confronted with the possibility of priesthood, strange, it was so strange. I remember thinking, this was the thought, I could see myself doing that. Wow. And then the run began. <laughs> I started to race away from that possibility because, again, I, I, it sort of... I didn't want the, the sacrifice. I didn't want the, uh, all that it meant to be a priest laying down your life. Uh, I was, I wasn't, I didn't have the maturity or the, you know, the, the, the wisdom, the generosity of, of spirit, you know, for that. Mm. Uh, but again, God sort of persisted with me, uh, this, this attraction inexplicable as it was for me. Uh, was lingering and it, I, I couldn't set it aside. It was, it was uh, really unsettling. And I knew that I had to look at this a little bit more carefully. And so then what I did was, and this is a good idea, I talked to somebody about it. This is really important. You don't, you don't have to sort of uh, weigh these things up alone and without help. Uh, when you're discerning, St. Ignatius actually talks about this. St. Ignatius of Loyola is one of the great spiritual masters of the church, and he has a lot to say about discernment. But St. Ignatius says that discernment should never be done without a spiritual director, without someone who's more experienced in the spiritual life, who you can bounce things off of, you can talk through things with, you can, uh, you go through this with someone, with someone supporting you. And that's what I did. I, I went to someone and I started to ask questions about seminary and priesthood. And uh, I found it very helpful. Uh, and it sort of uh, it put my mind at ease. It put a lot of my fears that I did have, the things that I was so anxious about, it put a lot of those things to rest. 
And it helped me to uh, have more freedom to say yes to God and yes to this possibility of, set of, of priesthood by going to seminary. So I really grew in freedom and uh, my ability to, to make a, a good decision, basically, by that's, asking, by talking to someone. That's fantastic. There was, I just want to go back to something you, you, you said there earlier, and it's, um, it, it, it was a very interesting point. And it's something I've, um, you know, I've, I've heard people speak about before where they say, you know, what well, God's plan, God may have a plan for you uh in life uh, I mean, he, he has a a, a a path traced out for you but you know through the gift of of free will you've chosen something completely different and you've gone wayward in your life um and next thing it's when you're the furthest away or whatever next thing you realize oh, oh i actually see where i gone wrong and this is not where god wants me but what do i do now he has cut me off but as the point that you're saying is you know like god works with our decisions he absolutely does. He very much works with our decisions. And even, you know, even our poor decisions, like the things that are less than ideal, and even our wrong decisions, even objectively bad decisions. It's funny, God can still use that. Like his, his goodness is such that he can bring good even out of wrong decisions, really yeah. foolish things that we do. That's my experience in my own life. And we know that to be true. That's how God's goodness is. So, and yes, he doesn't cut us off. And it, you know, so it's not as though you need to sort of solve a puzzle, you know, the, the riddle of God's will for you. And uh, if you don't, maybe this unspoken, uh, unarticulated fear is there that if I don't, if I mess this up, then my life is ruined. Yeah. No, that's, that is not the case. You know, God, uh, God wants you to be happy. He wants you to, uh, to live a good and like a, a substantial life. Uh, but even if you make less than ideal decisions, God will not abandon you. He'll work with what you, with what you give him. That said, it's good to, uh, to use the wisdom that is ours as Catholics, that's been handed down to us. We know an awful lot about discernment, about how to discover God's will for you, how to make good decisions. So we would do well to take those things on board yeah. So as to uh, cooperate with what God wants, you know, yeah. which is our holiness again and our, uh, to live life to the full. Yeah. Like you, uh, you mentioned as well about, you know, sometimes there, we, you know, some people can be, they can act on impulses, uh, under their impulses, or just can analyze things to the, to, you know, to, to, to death almost. Um, but then, you know, sometimes we come across um, there may be the, you know, fall into the trap of looking for signs, not necessarily discerning, but looking for signs where is, you know, if a, if a pig flies across the, the garden at a certain time and uh, upside down or whatever, that must mean that, you know, uh, and, and that, and, and I know, look, we, we, we've, we've seen it throughout scripture that sometimes God does um, operate with signs, but there's also a danger of, there's also a danger of, you know, basing your discernment solely on, on, on signs, isn't there? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, I yeah. think there, I think there is, I mean, yeah, we can, we can search frantically for signs. We can look for signs. And again, with that, without, <clears throat> when you're discerning on your own, you can fall into these traps very easily when you're not doing this with someone who again is, is wiser, who's like a, you know, someone who again is more experienced in the spiritual life, uh, who can, kind of help point things out to you. It's easy to fall into these traps, but sometimes we look for signs to confirm things that we just want, you know, like, okay, I, you know, I really would love to do this. And so I'm going to look for, I'm going to look for a sign from God. And you're kind of desperately looking for that sign then, you know, and you're, or you don't want something. I've, I've spoken to so many people talking about maybe priesthood or religious life or something, and they kind of fear it. And so they make it nearly impossible to God. They like, okay, well, if God gives me this sign specifically, then I know he's going to want me to be a priest. And it's just like, I, like God, again, can work with what you give him, but you, God has made us in such a way uh, that we have a mind, we have an intellect and we have a will. And mm. he, he's created us with this dignity, these abilities, basically. And 
He wants us to use those in order to make decisions. That's how he made us. So far better than, you know, uh, kind of looking for, you know, signs everywhere or whatever is to go through a, uh, is to kind of cooperate with the way that God has made us and uh, to go to yeah, make it, make a mature adult decision. Uh, Father Mike Schmitz, who has a lot of great things to say about discernment, talks about this. Um, yeah. that, um, we want, sometimes we want someone to just like tell us what to do. Yeah. We don't want to have to decide. We don't want to have to do the work. Um, we don't want to have to, to pull the trigger ourselves and make a decision. Uh, we just want someone to tell us what to do and then we'll do it. Well, the, the truth is that like, we know what God wants ultimately, which is for our holiness and for us to be with him in heaven. Uh, yeah. But God has, God has created us with this wonderful dignity. He's created us with the freedom and he respects that freedom. Yeah. And uh, we would like, it is for us as like adults to think carefully and reflect and then to make those decisions. Yeah. You, uh, you mentioned earlier on there as well yeah, about St. Ignatius uh, of Loyola. Um, and obviously, you know, with, there's the whole um, the Ignatian spirituality and, and, and discernment. Um, his story is fascinating because, you know, up until a certain point, he was far from, you know, discerning the, the will of God. Are you, can you give us a background on St. Ignatius? Mm, absolutely. So St. Ignatius was... Uh, was raised was first of all he was born in Spain in 1491 I want to say and uh, he he lived his the first part of his life very far from God as you alluded to there he uh, he was like a basically a soldier first a page boy and then became like a, a soldier and was very heroic but he had he had some some good characteristics some good virtuous traits. But as well as that, some like some really, <laughs> some really vicious traits as well. So, uh, for instance, he was very vain. Uh, he was impetuous. He was kind of like prone to anger, um, and he was living his life in a very worldly way. He 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 did not have like an awareness of, um, you know, the the spiritual life, the importance of his faith, etc. So all of that changed. I believe it was his sister-in-law was sort of, or like a, a, a relation of his anyway, was looking after him. And he wanted her to give, give her some of these like worldly novels that were popular at the time. You know, knights in shining armor, you know, rescuing damsels in distress, that sort of thing. And this lady, this relation of his was like, no, <laughs> I don't have any of that stuff. But what I do have is a book on the lives of the saints. And then I, I, think, I think it was the Bible. Uh, I could, be, I could be wrong on that, but it was definitely the lives of the saints uh, mm -hmm. and some other uh, holy book. And so while he was recovering, he started to read these books. And he also did somehow manage to get his whole hands on a copy of uh, one of those worldly books as well. But he noticed something strange. He noticed that when he read the books that uh, were, uh, the, were worldly or whatever, he noticed that he was kind of thrilled by them for a time, like his, his sort of, uh, he was, I don't know, carried away by these things and they made him feel good. But then after a while, he was left kind of uh, down, basically. He was kind of empty. But he noticed that when he read the books that nourished him spiritually, when he, when he read these books about God and the exploits of the saints, etc., he noticed that they stirred kind of this this kind of feeling within him, it, it, it felt good and he, he sort of was moved, but he noticed that that, that persisted, that he, he didn't um, slip back into sort of uh, being quite empty, but he noticed that, that it, it was kind of a, a lasting fulfillment. It, his, he was moved. He describes later on this, con this, uh, this experience as his experience of first of consolation, spiritual consolation and desolation. And one of the methods that he, he recommends for discernment uh, in prayer actually is based on that experience that all of us have of consolation and desolation. Anybody who's been praying 
for any length of time knows that sometimes prayer is easy and we're moved. We feel very close to God. The heart's kind of lifted up. And then there are other times when prayer is work. Uh, the catechism says that prayer is a battle. And sometimes, boy, it feels like it. That sometimes we don't feel like praying. We feel empty. We feel dry. And uh, that's normal. That's not a bad thing. It's just a, it's just a part of the, the normal life of prayer. But he was the first, he was not the, the first, but he, he was able to put his finger on this experience. And that experience, again, is actually very helpful when you're discerning. It's like you, you speak about, um, you know, desolation there. And, you know, if, if at first glance we can think, wow, that's like, you know, that's such a painful experience. That's something, that's something negative. But it's something we hear, like, you know, even the likes of Mother Teresa, where she went through, you know, these, these for years and years and years, right up to her death, she experienced this almost desolation in prayer. And, you know, St. John of the Cross speaks about, uh, is you know the the dark night of the soul um mm. but sometimes you know um i know this may be going off topic a small bit but sometimes you know maybe we can fall into the trap of entering prayer solely for the sake of us getting something out of it and if we haven't got something out of that particular mo that that particular um time of prayer well we're doing we're doing something wrong because you know like it, it is beautiful once you you know sometimes you can you go into prayer and, 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 and God has really revealed him, himself to you. There's other times you can go into prayer and, um, you know, we, 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 th th nothing is happening. You, you almost have to, uh, you almost have to, you know, physically throw yourself on the knees on your knees. And even that's a, almost a, a, a big deal, but that's all part and part. Uh, that's all part of the process really, isn't it? Absolutely. And it's, it's something that God allows to happen that out of love for us, it's a good thing. It's a good thing that that, that happens because uh, God wants us to love him, not to love the good feelings. Yeah. And so what God does is after, usually after a certain amount of time, initially, generally, not always, but generally the first period in your, in your spiritual life, when you first say yes to Christ is marked by a lot of consolations. It feels, Oh, it's just, you're on fire. This is, Beautiful. Everything that you, uh, everything that you learn new about your this your Catholic faith is just it's like it's like honey. It's just so sweet. And then uh, that gradually or sometimes abruptly uh, kind of fades, and you're left uh, much more desolate and dry. And you're you feel like you're you're there's something kind of wrong or whatever. Again, you can see how good God is in allowing us to do this because. Uh, God wants us to, God wants us to, to know and love him. He wants a real relationship with us. And uh, he wants us to not to love the good things that he gives, but to know and to love him who's giving them, you know, because yeah. it's only in him that we'll be ultimately filled and satisfied. Uh, and it's, it's ultimately him that we desire. Uh, so God like gives us these, these consolations as encouragement and then he kind of draws back then sometimes in order to, again, it's like calling us deeper, you know, he's, he's pushing us and we have to persevere then. And actually back to discernment, you can see how God uses discernment sometimes for this as well. Like you're faced with a major decision and you're not getting the answer right away, right? Yep. You pray and you pray and you pray again and it's just not coming. You just don't know what to do. There's no clarity. God is not being mean, right? God, in his love for you, in his goodness, may be calling you deeper. Yeah. He might be inviting you to trust him even when he's, uh, even, even when he doesn't have you right there by the hand. You know, he's like calling you out of the boat. If you think of the image, let's say, of St. Peter being called out onto the water, you know, like uh, in his goodness, God does that in order to, uh, to make our relationship with him more true. <laughs> Yeah. And more what it ought to be. So it just, yeah. it's his goodness really manifesting itself, even though it doesn't feel like that sometimes. It's amazing. Uh, like being a father now of, 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 of two children. Um, my, since I've become a father, it's actually taught me so much about my own relationship with God. Uh, there were two things that uh, 
two things that stood out. One was my eldest daughter, Jessica, when she was, she's now two and a half, when she was three months old. I remember one night I had her, um, she was lying down uh, on the bed and was trying to get her to sleep. And I remember you could nearly, there was just this, it was almost like the whole room became so still and she was just staring at me. Um, and next thing she, she gently kind of put her hand up on my forehead and next thing slowly down to my eye and my nose. And she was just, she, she, she was re it was like, she was really exploring daddy. It was really like, it was like, what, it wasn't just like, oh yeah, there he is. But she was, she was just taking the time. And it was something I, I remember at the time I was like, I, I was even afraid to, to you know, to, to let out a breath in case I, I, I um, the noise of it uh, broke the stillness because it was something for the next thing I was like, it just hit me. I was like, wow, this is what our relationship with, with God is supposed to be like. We just take that time to, there was no word spoken, but yet everything was, uh, uh, it was, was being spoken in the heart. And it was like, wow, it, it, it was amazing. The other one, and it, it alludes to uh, what you just said there is, you know, in the last, um, the last couple of weeks, months, whatever. Um, um, I, I should know the dates of all these important things. My, young, my youngest daughter began to walk and, you know, she took her first steps and it was, you know, it was a big move for a big moment for her, a big moment for us. But as her, as her father, I was like, you know, trying to encourage her. So yes, I, I took maybe an, another two or three steps away so I was no longer holding her but I was there but she um she was used to for so long me holding her me lifting her up carrying her around everywhere but now I wasn't and here she, she was she was able to stand on her own but she wasn't too sure what to do next and it looked as if that I was going away from her but I actually in, in fact I wasn't I was right there and if she was going to fall I was going to catch her there was there was no there was absolutely no fear of anything happening to her but for her um this was like wow and so there was that moment like what do i do now do i trust him um or do i not and and uh i, I think that that just that just image just came into my mind there as uh, as as you were speaking Isn't that beautiful um, oh my gosh that's a those are beautiful beautiful images uh, what are, yeah. those are two great great holy <laughs> moments <laughs> <laughs> the um you know fear I know we alluded to a while ago, but fear is something um, that can really hamper uh, discernment uh, at times. And I know from a personal experience, you know, before I even entered seminary, and I think even the the year bef the year leading up to it and everything, like all my actions at, at times, I was yes, this is the next thing. All of a sudden, you're like, "Whoa, what are you doing?" And so, you know, so sometimes fear and, and, and the thing you actually fear is something that doesn't actually exist in reality. Like, mm -hmm. for example, I remember the big thing was like, um, you know, once I entered seminary, what, like, that's it. My life is going to, is almost going to end. No one's going to want to talk to me anymore. Because I remember even with my own close friends uh, uh, down here in Cork, I told them nothing, absolutely nothing right up to the last minute. And it was literally as I was driving in, uh, the gate of Maynooth with um, my, my parents were with me. I was in the back seat. I was just driving in the front gate of St. Patrick's College in Maynooth and I sent out a group text saying, by the way, lads, uh, I'm into seminary. And because for the first month you have to have your phone turned off, turned it off. And I was like, whoo. <laughs> well, but again, it was, you know, as it turned out, there was nothing to fear. Okay, some people maybe hadn't, didn't react as well as others, but other people were. Um, uh, you know, the majority of people, you know, they were, they, they were so supportive, but it is sometimes we can, we can allow, we can allow that the fear. Sometimes it's, it's a fear of something that doesn't exist, or sometimes we just build things up in our mind so much and we allow it to, we allow it to influence um, the, the whole discernment process. Mm. No, I think that's, that's absolutely true. Uh, yeah. Uh, what if this happens, you know, what about this now? You know, those, those sort of what if questions, yeah, they can really be, they can add an awful lot of anxiety. But again, you can see the, you know, what that, uh, what that is like as an opportunity, it's an opportunity to double down on your trust in God, you know, that God, God has you, God yeah. has you. And uh, that your being available and open to God, you know, and, and, wanting what he wants, uh, 
God is not going to uh, let you down because of that. You know, yeah. um, the, again, like the, one of the, one of the kind of uh, great resources uh, of discernment, people were looking to learn more. Father Timothy Gallagher is a, uh, is a, is an author and he's wrote a number of books on discernment using St. Ignatius is St. Ignatius like wisdom basically, and making it very accessible to modern people. But one of the things that he says is that the necessary predisposition for discernment is trusting in God is the ability to say to God, like, I trust you and I want what you want. I want what you want. Mm -hmm. That is a hard thing to be able to say. Uh, mm -hmm. And it, I mean, it, it requires like a yeah, real digging deep on our part, you know, but all of those kind of what ifs and, you know, those, those fears that you, that you mentioned, like that is like, it's in those moments that it's our opportunity to, uh, to really dig deep and to put our trust in God. He has us, he is faithful. He's not going to let us down. The other thing is uh, fear as far as fear is concerned is some fear is the fear of the unknown and that can be addressed by finding out more information. Right? So again, if you go back to like my, just my example, uh, I had, I didn't know anything about what it meant to be a priest or seminary. I had no idea. I didn't have a clue. And so, yeah, I was racing. I was running away from this and simultaneously intrigued by this. What I, one of the things, the first things I needed to do was to find out more information mm. because in order to make a good decision, you have to know all of the necessary facts, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, we don't, we don't have to discern or make a decision on what we uh, don't have the, the information for. Uh, Father Mike Schmitz again says that you're never going to have to ask a question that you haven't been asked. And yeah. uh, one of his big things is getting more information. So like uh, whether it's, you know, you're, you're wondering about seminary or religious life for a woman or what college to go to or um, you know, should I marry uh, this person or not? You know, mm. a lot of times, like, you know, we're, we're sort of uh, crippled by fear and we don't need to make the decision right now, but we need to just get more information basically. And yeah. when we get more information and when we sift through that information using certain really helpful questions ourselves and bring that to prayer and we walk through this whole process with a guide, someone who can really help us and be a support to us, we come to a far greater clarity and confidence where we're able to say confidently, okay, I think this is the, the right thing to do, the best thing to do. I think this is what God would want me to, God wants me to do, you know? So again, those, those are some things that are helpful to have in place. I know, um, you know, feelings and feelings and emotions, they are, they're important insofar as because they'd be given to us by God. But sometimes, sometimes, um, sometimes we can, you know, there's a danger maybe of basing our discernment on how we feel because from one moment, you know, for one, one moment we can be having a, you know, a, a great day. Um, the next moment, the next day, you know, we're not having as great a day. And if we, you know, if you decide to base your discernment on say feelings like that, that can be a dangerous path. And I'm not saying that they, the feelings and emotions are, are bad because look, God has given them to us. Um, so they're good, but they're good in, their, in, 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 you know, when used correctly. How can they be a, a barrier at times to uh, discernment? Mm, yeah, good question. Yeah, so we talked about fear and how fear is kind of unhelpful. And um, yeah, the, you know, there may be other, uh, other feelings as well that we have that, might lead us uh, if we're if they're in the driver's seat they might be leading us astray so um the image that i have for feelings which I, i'll share with you uh don't know if it's any good or not but i uh it helps me is that feelings are like children right children in a family uh are are children in a family a good thing of course they are they're awesome oh my gosh do you know most most days you know but like they, they are they are, you know, even when they're acting up or whatever, you would, you wouldn't not want them to have them in your, you want not want to have them in your family, but 
should the children be running the household? Mm. No, <laughs> they shouldn't, right? Like, it just, it's not wise to have them running the household. So they're a good part of the family. They're super important. Uh, they make your family what it is and more beautiful. They're a gift from God, but they should not be in the driver's seat when you're making kind of uh, decisions. They have a part to play as you've, as you mentioned there. And I wouldn't even say feelings so much as maybe like spiritual experiences, but we'll kind of come to that in a second. Right. Uh, which is different from just like just the feels, the feelings, but um, what should be like, what should we be using and really, uh, yeah, like uh, what should play a more prominent role is our minds, our, our intellect, you know, really thinking about these questions, these things that we're facing. And, uh, and then as well as that, um, looking at what we want, not at a really superficial level, what I feel like or whatever, but on a, on a, a level that's, or a, in a way that's not unrelated to our, um, to our minds, to make this a little bit more concrete, right? Uh, I'm not going to do as good of a job as, as explaining it as him, but Father Mike Schmitz has this image of four doors. Are you familiar with this no. uh, in discernment? So. Okay. He has, a, he has a video. It's a YouTube video. Um, it's, uh, it's excellent about discernment. And he describes this process by which you are going through four successive doors. And you're asking four different questions as you approach these doors. And whether uh, the question is whether you kind of carry on and go through them or not. So the first, the first door or whatever that you come to is you're asking this question is the thing that I'm facing, the decision that I'm facing, is it good or evil? Right. And if it's evil, then we know what the answer is discernment over. You don't need to discern anymore. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's done. The second question is, is this a possibility for me? So the example he gives, which is excellent is he says, I don't have to discern whether or not to try out for the NBA. That door is closed to me. <laughs> Right. So the door is, it's not good or bad. It's neutral probably, you know, uh, but the door is closed. It's not a possibility for me. So I don't need to discern this anymore. Okay. The third door, the third question that you ask is where it, things get a little bit more interesting. Uh, the third question that you ask is, is this wise for me? And this is where we start to use our, really use our brains basically. So he says, Knowing what you know about yourself and where you've been and where you, you want to go, the sort of man or woman you want to be, and what you know God wants of you, right? Your ultimate purpose in life. Knowing all of those things, is this decision a good thing, or like a wise thing or not? Is this going to bring you closer to where you want to go or not? Mm. So you could see like, that's okay. That that's, re that's requiring some, some more careful reflection and thinking. Right. Yeah. And the final one, which he says, everybody hates when he brings up, which is, it's funny because it's true. The fourth question, the fourth door that you come to is the question, do I want this? And again, people hate that because they would prefer someone to just make, just to tell them what to do. That's to make the decision for them and they could just do it, just follow the orders or whatever, you know? But again, part of being like a grown up is like uh, being responsible for like your life to have like a, to take kind of ownership of, of your life, not without God, obviously, but cooperating with God because of the dignity that you have and the gifts that he's given you in terms of your mind and your, your will. And uh, yeah, like uh, kind of, charting with God the course that your life is going to take. Do I want this or not? So um, just back to the, your initial question of the feelings. Uh, when we ask these questions and we make these decisions, it, there often is, uh, Catholics will often talk about like a confirmation or some sort of like a, a generally it's described as a peace, you know, like it made a decision and now I have peace about this decision. Have you heard this before? Yeah, I have. I have indeed. Okay. So like that is a, it can be a helpful thing for sure. It can be, it can be a helpful thing. I think it can be a helpful um, confirmation of your discernment. Uh, I don't know that it's always there, 
Uh, but I think it is a, it is generally there and it's generally a helpful thing. Uh, but I wouldn't call that just a feeling, right? I would think that that was a, uh, a gift from God, you know, like a sort of uh, a, a help from God when you uh, make a decision. Yeah. When you make a decision, basically that is uh, yeah. In accord with like God's will for you. So anyway, it's not just like your, your feelings or whatever. It's, it's something a little bit more substantial than that. Yeah. There, um, you know, sometimes I wonder, like, again, when, when I ask these questions, I'm thinking back to a lot of times the mistakes I made in my own discernment uh, at, at various times in my life. But, um, you know, sometimes we can take the discernment process as, you know, use it almost as a camouflage, as a way of maybe, and I know we kind of alluded to it at the start, but a way of telling God uh, what it is that, um, what it is that he wants me to do, as opposed to actually, you know, being totally open and say, well, Lord, where do you want me to go? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that, and I think, and I, I know particularly, um, and I'm sure you probably experienced it as well when you were talking about when you first started the idea of priesthood coming into your mind. Because I know when that, when I first when the idea first came uh, to me, and that was I remember around the year 2006, uh, I was doing everything, trying to run in every uh, direction and 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 do deals with God. And I was <laughs> look, look this far, but look, if we just let me do this, then we look at this and this yeah, and this, right. and then when he fulfilled his his uh, his end of the deal i'm like okay well actually this is not what i want so i'm going to go another way. and things yeah. just ended up disaster mm. um you know there's a danger there as well of i just was like that just using um you know the discernment process as a you know not doing it correctly or using it as a camouflage to tell god what i want and again i suppose that all boils down to what we were saying about fear really mm. yeah absolutely i think so and uh yeah, so we, we definitely do that, you know, bargain with God, tell God what we really want, make it nearly impossible for him to, you know, like uh, show us or give us a sign of something we really don't want to do in the first place. Uh, or, you know what else, another way discernment is misused uh, is by people who don't want to make a decision or who don't want to say no to you. Again, this is like a total Catholic world thing, right? But uh, super annoying when, when you ask someone to do something and they're like, Hmm, y'all have to discern that. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. That is almost always in my experience, someone saying no, but I don't want to tell you no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You'll never hear from me again about this, this question. I have to go and discern that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so again, if what, what a, uh, yet another, I just, I know I keep circling back to this, but it is so helpful. And again, St. Ignatius says that uh, it is the, it is one of the essential things for discernment is yeah. not to do it alone, to do it with someone because yeah. someone having someone who's with you on this process, uh, supporting you is going to be able to point out to you the ways yeah. that you're like uh, hedging your bets with God, that yeah. you're, uh, you're not doing really discernment, but you're avoiding, you know, yeah. certain things, or he's going to be able to, he or she will be able to, to really help you to avoid some of those pitfalls and to yeah. like make good decisions. That's yeah. going to be like, uh, it's again, it's going to make your life. It's going to be a huge blessing because it'll help you to live life to the full, to discover God's beautiful plan for you and to live that, you yeah. know, and, and that's key. I, I know you've said it a few times there uh, throughout this talk. It's key having that right person uh, to journey with you because um, like I know a, a number of times we see it in the lives of the saints, um, as, as you say, and when they refer to the spiritual director. But it really hit me during my time in seminary, and it was when a, a, a priest said it, because sometimes, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to discern things. We're trying to ask God things. That, and like, we're looking for signs where, and it's almost like in our prayer that, no, 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 I don't need anyone else because God will speak directly to me. Mm -hmm. but, you know, God speaks to us through people, through, you know, and, and if there's a spiritual director, uh, if we have a spiritual director and they're, they're there for that specific reason, well, you know, this, uh, and they're praying and you're praying and to be totally honest and open, well, 
this is this is this is God speaking to you through this person. Totally. Yeah. Absolutely. I. Yeah. I think that's uh that's very true. And again, you just avoid so many of the of the the pitfalls and the ways that you know you can get stuck in in a rut. You know, with discernment, it's very it's very helpful. And even like the even the saints, like if Saint Ignatius says that he needs a, like a, someone to help him, you know, discern, and uh, like his like amazing like spiritual sons, these like holy Jesuit priests, they needed like someone to help them to discern. Uh, all of us need that, <laughs> you know, all of us need that help. You know, none of us, uh, none of us need to do it alone. And we, it'd be wise not to, you know, to, to really find somebody that's, that we can go to. Yeah. And I know, you know we spoke about, you know, we're supposed to talk about the four doors and uh, with Father Mike Schmitz and, you know, uh, a lot of it is how, a lot of it can be discerned, you know, it can be based as well. Like, is this good for me or not? You know, recently um, there was, you know, just thinking of two, two different friends. One was trying to, to buy a car. The other is trying to buy the, the right house. Um, and they're like, and you know, there, there may be, I, particularly one I was, I was just thinking when, as they were speaking, they're, they're going down the, beginning to go down the path of, oh, I, I, there needs to be a sign. There needs to be a sign in the front garden or the sign of, Oh, this, mm. when it comes to things like when it comes to things like that that you know doesn't necessarily affect our you know our, our, our relationship with god and our spiritual level how do you how do you make a decision on, on on things like that or is it like you say you know you just you get the information mm. yeah i think that's part that's a, a good uh, those are great examples yeah i think that you know you want to you can bring all those things to prayer none of nothing is like kind of uh, off limits for God. And we want to ask God for, uh, for wisdom. And, you know, we depend on God to make good decisions and, you know, things that are going to be good for, let's say our, your family or, uh, or whatever it is that your decisions you're facing. But yeah, we, we do the work, you know, we sort of say like, okay, do our homework about this thing. All right. You know, find out about the house and, you know, about the, the, the schools in the area. And like, there's so many factors that would have to go into that. Like all those things they need to, they, we have to kind of uh, apply. Yeah. Like a, apply our minds to those. We have to pay attention to those things. And then uh, the more information that we get uh, the greater clarity that we'll have. And then we make our decision knowing that God is with us. That yeah. God is with us, you know, and even he's with us, even in our, you know, our business decisions and our, you know, the, the houses that we live in our, you know, the cars and stuff like that. Like we, like we, we act as best we can. Uh, God gives us a lot of freedom. Uh, and then whatever we choose, we know that God is with us, that God has us. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I do think, uh, but asking those questions and getting more information, I think is the thing that we might want to avoid and what your, your, it sounds like the, the temptation for these, your friends are is avoiding, but uh, yeah, I think we want it. We've got to do the work. Yeah. God. It is, and you know, it, it is, it, it's funny last night I had to do a, a short interview on um, Radio Maria and that was on the sacrament of reconciliation. But one of the questions that was asked uh, to me was, you know, why do you, why do I think that a lot of, people um you know don't necessarily feel the need for um you know for for for, for the sacrament anymore um and don't worry you'll see now by how this is linked into the might be off another talk uh, and w one thing i kind of felt was and again i was looking at my own life is you know we're so in, in, in today's world, we're so busy. We're so, life is just so busy. We're, you know, we're running left, right, and center. As I was saying, we have technology everywhere. Our heads are stuck in screens and computers, uh, whatever. And, you know, sometimes even when it comes to prayer and our relationship with God, we can go through the motions without even spending that proper, proper time in, 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 in the relationship with God, because that's the primary purpose of our being is, is, is for a relationship with God and mm -hmm. I just kind of wondered and it was again it was my own opinion that you know what because people are falling into that trap and that and life's getting so busy and people not even thinking about um, you know what what it what it what it means to be 
you know, what is the purpose of, of, of being? What is the purpose of God, of a relationship with God? That sometimes then things like that can begin to, to numb out and, and, and that. And I guess it's kind of the same with, um, with, this, it's the same with prayer, the same with, uh, with, with, with discernment. If we don't really give it that, uh, you know, the, the, we're, all, we're always going to come across different decisions we have to make in life. Some are, are huge, huge decisions. Others are, 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 are smaller things. But it does take it does take time and it does take patience because we're kind of living in a world today where we want everything now. Everything is instant, instant, instant. We want an answer and we go to God. Like, it's almost like, you know, if, if, I, if I send a, a message here on WhatsApp, you know, if someone, sometimes you want to say, if someone's not, hasn't, the blue ticks haven't come up in 30 seconds, you're like, what? What is this person doing? And that is almost like the same with God. It's like, you know, I'm discerning something, but God, I'm discerning it here on my time. Like, you know, the clock is ticking. Uh, I know better than you do. And, and it, it's, a, it's a slight, uh, uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's a slight trap, I guess. Are there any final thoughts that you want to, to share on, on, on anything with the, with, with the discernment process before we, we come to a close? Absolutely. Yes. Just a, a couple of different things, just some real practicals. Uh, one bit of advice that I was given and I found it so helpful is to t- pick a season to discern. Do not discern like a decision that you have to make perpetually. You will drive yourself insane. Okay. So you take a season. Uh, my spiritual father was very fond of the season of Advent, right? Yeah. You don't have to wait until Christmas to make a decision. Don't worry. That's not what I'm saying. But he was saying like, as a like a, as a season, it's a, it's wonderful. It's a season of waiting on the Lord of silence and kind of, um, uh, yeah, anticipating the Lord, let's say. Uh, so it's kind of maybe especially conducive to it. But if you take just a few weeks, maybe to consider whatever the question is, that is that you're discerning. And if you arrive at the end of that time with clarity, you've got enough information, you're able to confidently make a decision and say, no, I think this is, it's good. It's available to me. It's wise. I want this. And I sense that this is God's plan. This is God's will for me. Uh, Great. If you can make that decision, if you can't, that's okay. You can set it to the side and you can return to it later. Right. So, but having a season is really helpful because again, uh, we can, it can become the dominant thing in our spiritual life. Whatever the question is that we're discerning when there's an awful lot of other stuff that just needs attention. Our normal growth, you know, in um, coming to know and love God, growing in virtue, turning away from sin, you know, setting aside vice and stuff. So anyway, um, pick a season. The other, the other thing is uh, maybe just recommendations. If yeah. you're interested in finding out more, like we just covered, kind of flitted and covered, but there's so much beautiful wisdom that the church has about discernment. Like it is so beautiful to be Catholic. Oh my gosh. God has like given us this uh, incredible inheritance, this beautiful wisdom that like, it really gives us such direction and support in life. It's so good. We've only been able to just kind of cover just on a surface level, this stuff. So if you're interested in finding out more again, uh, first, Maybe Father Mike Schmitz has these great introductory videos that are very helpful. Um, he's, he's a great teacher. He's great at explaining things. Then uh, Father Timothy Gallagher has, again, like St. Ignatius wisdom distilled and made very presentable for a modern audience. And then if you want to learn even more, go to St. Ignatius himself. Uh, yeah. He's got an awful lot of like beautiful things, wisdom uh, to offer about just the, the spiritual life uh, you know, the human heart and God, most especially how God works with us. It's class. So those are just some good recommendations for you. No, they're fantastic recommendations. And I'll, I'll actually put links to each of those recommendations at the bottom here of, at the description box for anyone who, uh, who wants to click on them and, and get any further information because they, they are fantastic. I, I, even in, over the, the course of the last 12 months, about 12 months ago, I, I first came across uh, Father Timothy Gallagher and I'd just been listening and went in the car listening to his thing is absolutely golden and, and for Mike Schmitz, well, you know, he's everything he produces is, 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 is amazing. So it's, uh, you know, they're absolutely fantastic uh, resources for Shane. I know that you have uh, parish work to get to very soon. Uh, and that's, so I'm not going to keep you any longer, but before we finish, could I ask you just to give us uh, a, 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 pr- a prayer and blessing? 
I will happily. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. First of all, it's just been great to be with you. And, uh, it's such a, a beautiful thing. I, I, and I, I really hope that this apostolate is just wonderful. I hope it's a huge blessing in the lives of the people who listen to it. I'm sure it will be. Thank you so much for the shame. Okay. So we'll finish praying the, the hail Mary in the name of the father and of the son and of the Holy spirit. Amen. Hail Mary full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Jesus. Holy Mary, Mary, Mother Father of God, God pray, pray for us sinners, now God. and at the hour of our death. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you all and your families, and He give you, may He give you your, His peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father Shane, thank you so, so much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. It was a fascinating topic, and uh, uh, you know, you, you were someone that, uh, from, from the word go, your name was always coming up, so it was absolutely fantastic to to, to, to get to speak to you. So thank you so much for your time. Great. Great being with you. Thanks, Brian. Thank you very much. God bless.